So here we're in this weird situation. ERP and MEG gives us time but not space. Functional MRI gives us space but not time. But that's no good. We need both. Right? I mean, it's nice to have one, but it's just frustrating. We want both at once in the same experiment, in the same subject. And there's only one way to do that, and that's intracranial recording. And this happens only, uh, like the video that I showed you before, that was stimulation. But you can also use those electrodes to record. So only in the circumstance where a per this is, we're now talking human neuroscience, there's lots you can do in animals, but in humans, the only way to get both space and time with high resolution at the same time is in those situations where you have a person who is going to undergo neurosurgery and where the neurosurgeons, for clinical reasons, have decided to stick electrodes on or in the brain. And that patient is hanging out in a hospital for a few days and is really nice. And despite the huge trauma they're going through, they're willing to look at your stupid pictures so that you can record responses from their brain. Some people are willing to do that. Bless them. They give us gorgeous data. Okay. So here's a picture of uh, one of the people we tested, um, Japanese guy. You will see videos of him in a, in a lecture or two. Um, he had electrodes all over the bottom of his, um, of his brain. Let me orient you. This is a bottom picture of the brain. So let's see. If it was me, if you're looking at the bottom of my, my brain that way. Bottom, I mean, back of the brain, uh, left side, right side. Everybody oriented? OK. Um, so it's like the cerebellum is removed. You're just looking up at the bottom surface. OK, so primary visual cortex is back here. And these are all high-level visual processing regions. These are all the locations where the surgeons put those electrodes. Those are the locations I've been studying for years. So when I heard that this guy was having electrodes placed there, I was like, oh my god, that's very powerful. Um, so we made some stimuli and sent them to our collaborators in Japan. And this gentleman was kind enough to look at our stimuli and let, and let us record responses from his brain. Uh, and here they are. So this is a little hard to read. So this is, um, these electrodes here are that strip there. OK, so if you just kind of take this and rotate it, um, you have, so this one here, 174, is that one 174? 184 is 184 there. OK, each little graph is the electrical response from an electrode with a little two millimeter contact sitting right on the cortex over about 300 milliseconds, where the stimulus is presented at zero. And the different colors are the different kinds of stimuli. So you can guess what red is. <laughs> uh, and what you see is, look at electrode 173. That's right there, that electrode right there. Honking big and fast response to faces and like nothing to um, words. He's Japanese, so it's both hira and, and kanji. Digit strings, line drawings of objects, photographs of objects, photographs of body parts. Big bunch of nothing. That response is not just face selective. That response is face exclusive, right? I mean, zero to everything else. So one of the answers to the data I showed you guys before, where you get that partial response to objects in the face area is, well, we really didn't have the resolution, spatial or temporal, to isolate just what those neurons are doing. But here, for this 200 milliseconds in that little teeny patch of brain, that's an exclusive response to faces. OK? Make sense? Um, all right. Uh, and you can see it starts really fast, right around 150 milliseconds consistent with measurements from ERP and MEG outside the head, right? OK. Um, so that's intracranial recording. Advantages, it's the only method we have with high spatial and temporal resolution. Disadvantages, it's extremely invasive. Um, and it's only possible in patients who already have something neurologically wrong, right? So that's not ideal, because um, you could worry the epilepsy or the tumor or whatever it is they're having neurosurgery for could be changing the way their brain responds. That's an actual problem. But what you do, as usual, is you triangulate and you think about what the problem is. And in some cases, you actually get data from brain regions that are remote from where you think the problem is. Um, and most of these, you know, so you just have to worry about that. But I think uh, in many cases, the inferences are still pretty good. Um, the big problem is that these data are extremely rare. Uh, and we scientists don't get any control of where the electrodes go. And that's a good thing. If anybody you know is ever facing neurosurgery, the last thing you want is a neurosurgeon talking to me about what I'm interested in. 
You want the neurosurgeon thinking only about what does this patient need? And then if it happens to be beneficial to me, lovely, but that should not be a priority for the neurosurgeon, right? And that means that us scientists just have to sit on the sidelines waiting for these gorgeous data to land in our lap on the rare occasions that they do. Okay. Um, but again, these data don't tell us about the causal role. We keep coming back to that point, right? They're beautiful. They're spectacular. Now, for the first time, we have both space and time at the same time in a not, not quite normal, but pretty close to normal human brain. Awesome. But that's not the same as the causal role. 